Right, so for as much as far too many of our politicians on both sides of the house right now are in hock for the Israel lobby, happy to do their bidding, aid and abet them in their genocide and continue to ignore the overwhelming will of the British people who want a ceasefire, we don't look at our media in the same way, and we probably should. We know MPs get lobbied. We know they get lots of lovely perks via associated groups such as Labour Friends of Israel and the Tory equivalent. The anti-Semitism scam against Jeremy Corbyn saw a number of newspapers come out and accuse him of being weak on tackling the issue, being anti-Semitic himself, and doing whatever was within their power to do so. The Guardian was notable for this, particularly Jewish journalist Jonathan Friedland. But as much as we can surmise he might have had pro-Israel leanings from what he wrote, his mother incidentally was Israeli born, read into that what you will, though Friedland once wrote she was even more hawkish than he was on matters relating to Israel. But this isn't about Friedland, at least not in any sense I'm aware of, because another far more blatant example of entryism into the media by Israel has been uncovered in the US. And it has begged the question, how could this have happened? And has it happened elsewhere? Is it happening here? Right, so pro-Israeli headlines in our mainstream media, they are nothing new to us. But we take such things with a heavy pinch of salt these days when we can read an article one moment and then witness the bare, uncensored imagery of what is happening in Gaza right now on social media as we see the genocide actually play out without any filter, no bias. And although in this era of deep fakes, it's no longer necessarily true to say the camera doesn't lie, when the images are so numerous and coming from so many different sources, and have been happening consistently for so long, we know beyond doubt what we're witnessing to be true. We know the power of the mainstream media. We know its power to influence and distort as well as inform. Those of us on the left of politics, those of us who were supporters and activists for Corbyn's labour, as I was, knew the power they had, the influence they could bring to bear from daily attack pieces on Corbyn, accusing a lifelong anti-racist of being a literal danger to Jewish life in the UK. Certainly worth remembering as MPs currently claim to fear for their own safety as they are in the news now when Corbyn being attacked or with people camping on his doorstep or climbing on his roof even when by these same people worrying about themselves now we're laughing about that then and whether you like Corbyn or not surely the hypocrisy of that is something you can acknowledge and agree with. But there's been a scandal stateside which might imply that Israel are upping their game possibly and again, the media has been complicit in this. The New York Times, one of the largest and most prestigious of US newspapers, has, it has been discovered, employed as a journalist, a former member of the Israeli Defense Force, whose written work has amounted to little more than pro-Israel propaganda, all coming out after the paper ran a front page piece by this individual smearing Palestinian resistance fighters as using systematic sexual violence. The article was co-written by a woman called Anat Schwartz, whose employment began at the New York Times late last year, when her first article was a piece called Screams Without Words, which became widely discredited due to the many unevidenced, unsubstantiated claims made regarding the night of October 7th, and accusations against Hamas, accusing them of using rape and mutilation against Israelis on that night, systematically using sexual violence as a weapon of war. The family of one alleged victim kicked up Mary Hell over it, said they'd been misled about the intent of the article, and whose story made up around a third of the whole article. A poor piece by a poor journalist. But then Schwartz wasn't just a poor journalist, she wasn't actually a journalist at all. In fact, what she was, was a filmmaker and former Israeli intelligence officer in the IDF. How in blazes did she get the job then? The New York Times is one of the biggest names in US journalism, one of their biggest papers, a prestigious place. That word's gonna get used a lot, prestigious, I'm in a mood for it. Journalists across the world, never mind just the US, would give anything to give a byline in that paper. They can really say they've made it if they get into the New York Times. It's somehow a complete non-journalist got a gig there. How that happened absolutely needs to be made public because if Israel can infiltrate the media there, I'm not saying that's exactly what has happened here, but if they can, then they can do it anywhere. Now this Screams Without Words article came out in late December and was co-authored by three people. Jeffrey Gettleman, who is the South Asia Bureau Chief for the New York Times currently, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, however he's been caught out a time or two in the past, Jewish chap, 
uh, along with Anat Schwartz and someone else called Adam Sella, who is based in Tel Aviv, but works for the New York Times. And also happens to be Anat Schwartz's nephew by marriage. And at just 24, he's done amazingly well to be writing for the New York Times at such a young age as well, hasn't he? Now, Schwartz's husband, Dan Sola, uh, po uh, Dan Sala even, posted a very interesting kind of an introduction to his wife in relation to that Screams Without Words piece. Made all the more interesting given the response I just mentioned from the family of one victim who were interviewed for it. He wrote on social media, Two months of literally round-the-clock work ended yesterday when this devastating story was published. You know Annette Schwartz is a filmmaker, but a few days after October 7th, her life took a turn and she started drilling down into some of the most horrific angles of the Hamas attack. I was sceptical initially, but for Annette, my scepticism only makes the challenge more interesting. Annette and her fellow reporters, the Pulitzer Prize-winning Jeffrey Gettleman and my amazing nephew Adam Seller, interviewed over 150 people for this investigation, and the things they saw and heard were unbearable. The story is not for everyone. Parts of it will haunt you at night, but it's extremely important that the truth will be out. You should have stuck with your feelings of scepticism, sunshine. Schwartz was not a journalist. She was a filmmaker as well as having been in the IDF. Gettleman, for his part, Pulitzer Prize or not, has a track record of overt pro-Israel leanings and also making stuff up completely fabricating a quote, for example, by former Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe when he was an Africa correspondent. Schwartz herself wasn't exactly around the clock, working around the clock either. She still found time for social media too. She liked a post on October 7th calling for Gaza to be turned into a slaughterhouse, a post that was so damning, South Africa actually cited it in their case against Israel at the International Court of Justice. She also liked a post relating to the long debunked story about 40 beheaded babies and also liked another post, this one a lot more sinister given the position she had got herself into, relating to building an effective propaganda campaign to equate Hamas with ISIS. What wonderful journalistic integrity that was on show. You cannot have journalists more interested in making news than reporting it. That's insane, especially in light of the New York Times having fired another reporter, Jasmine Hughes, simply for signing a letter opposing Israel's genocide. That certainly puts that paper's bias on this issue starkly on show. So why did the New York Times hire Schwartz? Was it their doing? Was it something they planned because of their bias? It does at least seem plausible, given how they treated Hughes. Did they want someone who would just frame Palestinians as subhuman monsters and Schwartz was willing to do it, journalist or no? And it very much is no, since she had never ever worked as a journalist anywhere else ever before before she got this gig at one of the most prestigious papers in america churning out gut-wrenching filth that served only the interests of the israeli propaganda machine and has brought that prestigious publication into severe disrepute but could it have been something else did schwartz present herself to the new york times as something she wasn't did she fraudulently gain employment there did her former intelligence training help her do that what are we to make of other former intelligence operatives who may have ingratiated themselves into the media, or politics even? Because I'm thinking right now of Asaf Kaplan, who Keir Starmer hired to spy on members' social media, facilitating his purge to the left. Kaplan was also IDF intelligence. I'm honestly leaning towards the former. I'm sure she was a fantastic state intelligence asset, but this really does smack of a paper with an agenda, employing someone prepared to do something no journalist of any reasonable professional integrity was prepared to. As this has come out, the staff are split at the New York Times, half of them outraged at the abandonment of journalistic integrity, but that still leaves half of the newsroom who aren't. And that Schwartz and the New York Times are apparently parting ways now, but that really is only because this has all been found out, isn't it? The paper's launched an investigation, but what will it find in investigating itself? Frankly, this needs independent investigation, because people need to know that if that paper has been compromised further. Who enabled it? Who's driving it? Is this more malign Israeli influence higher up the chain? Who can trust any reporting on Israel coming from them now? <clears throat> now, you can argue that this might just be one paper, one example of said propaganda being delivered, but it isn't. Arguably, a more damaging story was the one the Wall Street Journal ran, implying UNRWA, the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees, was laundering money for Hamas, which triggered the US and Genocide Joe to pull funding for UNRWA, which in turn triggered our government here in the UK to do likewise, because we copy the US all the time, 
and other nations did the same. UNRWA is still facing financial collapse right now and has given up trying to get aid into northern Gaza these days. That piece was written by a woman called Carrie Keller Lynn, who had also served in the Israeli Defence Force. Fundamentally, the question is, is this happening in our media too? With the stories many of our rags turn out, how many more newspapers around the world could well be compromised? Perhaps journalistic integrity is sorely lacking as well. I certainly believe that. It's why this channel exists, after all. Meanwhile, as the Israeli propaganda machine continues to flex wherever it can find an outlet to spread its nonsense, Israel continues to be laid bare at the International Court of Justice. I covered an absolutely astonishing presentation on behalf of the Arab League of Nations on this video recommendation, where Israel's very right to exist is on legally rocky ground. Fascinating stuff I wasn't aware of. Do give it a look. It's a real learning curve. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks.